Welcome everyone to the Nian Lecture Series. This initiative is the result of a collaboration between Nian, uh, Center for the Study of Non-European Art in Campus, and the SMFA at Tufts University. Um, before we and also, of course, uh, with the uh, support of the Getty Foundation through their Connecting Architects program. Uh, so before we introduce our very distinguished guests for this evening, uh, just a quick reminder, as usual, uh, you are able to ask questions after the lecture through uh, the chat um, tool on our um, YouTube channel. Uh, so you can write uh, whatever you want to ask there and we can pass on to our guest. Uh, so, Claudia, can you please present our guest? Yeah, um, good afternoon or good night to everyone. Boa noite. It's my big pleasure to present uh, Melissa McCormick, who actually probably is already known of many of you. Melissa is a professor, um, Andrew Mello professor for Japanese art and culture at Harvard. She's an art historian interested in the relations between text and image, as well as genre issues. And she also works on Buddhism. Melissa has worked extensively on medieval Japanese art and particularly on the tale of uh, Genji. Um, and she has published The Tale of Genji, a visual companion in 2018, and also was the co author of uh, ca the catalog for The Tale of Genji, a Japanese classic illustrated uh, exhibition that was up at the Met in New York. Today, she will uh, speak, uh, she'll give us a lecture on Otagaki Hengetsu's um, discourse, uh, Discursive Ceramics and the Poetics of Hapitic uh, Reading. So, sorry about the pronunciations. Um, very serious about that. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> And I thank you, you so now. much. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to speak about my recent research. I just want to say uh, in the beginning what an honor and delight it has been to work through the Connecting Art Histories program with my colleagues um, in Brazil with Professor Claudia Matos and um, Professor Patricia Meneses at Unicampu, and also um, consulting on the wonderful Japanese art co course taught by Dr. Juliana Maues. Um, that's been a real pleasure. Um, so today I will discuss my ongoing research on the 19th century um, non-artist Otagaki Dengetsu. And I just want to make sure that you can all see my screen well. Is that okay? Uh, okay, just let me know if there are any problems with that. Um, and I'm going to be talking specifically about her inscribed ceramics, like the work um, that you see here, and which was used for the advertisement for this talk. This is a brazier used to boil hot water for sencha tea. So while Rengetsu's, um, power, uh, Rengetsu's pottery is much beloved and discussed, my hope is to develop a theoretical framework for understanding her ceramics that accounts for their complexity. I'm interested, most of all, in interpreting them through a phenomenological lens and specifically in articulating their haptic nature. So I'm going to elaborate on the meaning of this term, my use of the term haptic later in the talk, but suffice it to say here that I aim to emphasize more than the tactile nature of her ceramics and how they engage, in other words, the sense of touch. Rather, I'm interested in their haptic quality, which means um, it refers to a kind of perception that combines the tactile, so the touch of a surface, as well as the kinesthetic involving movement, which primarily um, refers to receiving information through the, through the hands and by grasping and uh, and moving an object in space. So this, I think, is integral to um, understanding Dengetsu ceramics. And a discussion about these issues allows for a meditation on the 
differences between vision and touch, as well as um, the longstanding art historical discourse on haptic visuality, beginning with Regal, and the phenomenon of two-dimensional images that seem to engender a haptic response from the viewer. So the work of a 19th century Japanese nun has even more to teach us because of the very uh, specific epistemological notions that were operative in her environment and that appear in her other artworks. So my ultimate goal is to bridge these aspects of her work. And before um, discussing her ceramics, though, I would like to provide you with some foundational biographical information that will help illustrate her social situation. So Dengetsu was one of the most prolific artists of her generation, and a vast number of her paintings, calligraphy, and ceramics are held in collections around the world. She's extremely well known today with numerous exhibitions in and outside of Japan that have featured her work. My initial foray into Dengetsu studies was prompted by an invitation to write an essay for a forthcoming volume published by the National Museum of Asian Art in Washington, DC. The volume edited by Dr. Frank Feltons features objects from the Mary and Cheney Cowles collection, as will many of my slides today. And it focuses primarily on the celebrated Japanese painter, Tomioka Tessai. So in addition to Dengetsu, this volume will feature many works by Tessai. Now Tessai was a quintessential Japanese literati artist. Um, he was invested in the notion of a pan-Asian literati um, culture and um, the art of the, he was immersed in the art of the Ming and Qing dynasties. And here you're looking at a photograph of Tessai at the age of 70 in his studio. So both Tessai and Dengetsu lived in an era of tremendous transition. They both lived to see the end of the 300 year Tokugawa shogunal regime and the beginning of the Meiji era, which ushered in a new time of imperial symbolism and a different kind of engagement with the world beyond the archipelago, meaning Europe and America but also neighboring lands, especially in the realm of Sino-Japanese cultural exchange. So just to give you a glimpse of what Tessai um, was up to, take a look at these scrolls. This is just really the tip of the iceberg of Tessai's output. And even at a, a glance, you can see um, his kind of bold style. It's large, kind of solidly, um, unorthodox in an orthodox kind of way. And he was an amateur painter, not formally trained. He took the literati ideal very seriously. So what does this very bold, um, you know, 19th century, early 20th century painter like Tessai have to do with Dengetsu, with this Buddhist nun? Well, some might say everything there would be no Tessai without Dengetsu. Tessai's family lived near Dengetsu's home for a period of time. And that was a neighborhood that was a kind of hub for artists and craftspeople. At that point, Dengetsu was making a living as an artist and she became an important role model and mentor for the young Tessai. Tessai lived with her for a year and assisted her and she in turn became a kind of benefactor. She later paid, um, I'm sorry, I'm hearing a lot of background noise. Claudia, I think you have to turn off your mic, please. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I forgot about that. Let me see. Um, so at that point, Nengatsu, when she was um, interacting with Tessai, uh, most often, she was making a living as an artist, and she became a very important role model and mentor for the young Tessai. So he lived with her, he assisted her, and she became a kind of benefactor, and she paid for his education later on. She even encouraged him to take a transformative trip 
to Nagasaki. And if any of you have been to Nagasaki even today, you'll understand what that means because uh, the temples and Chinese culture that was accessible there was extremely important for the young Tessai. So this enriched his knowledge and his intellectual horizons. So then Getsu was that, in that way very influential for Tessai, but many other artists, um, literati, thinkers. Um, she was very much active in these circles in her day. Um, and she collaborated with many artists as well, including Tessai and some joint works of, of painting and calligraphy. So here you're looking at a portrait of Dengetsu painted 23 years after her death by Tessai. And admiration for Dengetsu grew after her death. Scholarly work on her has to deal with the many layers of stories and anecdotes and myths that became attached to her over the years. In particular, many of her poems celebrate the imperial reign. So they are felicitous in nature, and she was also known to have developed a friendship and acquaintances with imperial loyalists at the moment when the Tokugawa military regime was being overthrown. So she has a political aspect to her work as well. And this made her a kind of uh, figure appealing to nationalist causes later and into the 20th century. So this is one aspect of identity that one has to grapple with in terms of getting a sense of what was going on in her day. On the other hand, there's also a very strong emphasis on her identity as a Buddhist nun and a tendency to interpret her poetry strictly along those lines. Rengetsu does have many autobiographical texts, however, in close to 1,000 poems and hundreds of letters. The art historian Paul Berry believes there might be thousands of letters in her hand that are still unpublished. Some parts of her life are therefore extremely well documented with others better fleshed out than others. She was probably born in the Sambogi Entertainment District of Kyoto to a father of samurai status and a mother who some speculate was a geisha in the district. Whatever the case may be, she was immediately adopted into the Otagaki family her adoptive father had a coveted hereditary position as a head administrator at Chionin Temple. Here's a view of that temple and a photo of its grand 17th century Sanmon gate that one passes through to enter the complex. It's interesting to imagine Dengetsu growing up in its shadow, to think of her passing by this temple daily, and it's important to consider the social circles to which she had access. It's worth considering what it meant that she was, adopt, she was an adopted daughter of a man with the hereditary position of temple administrator, meaning that he oversaw the monks at this prestigious temple. It was a fairly lofty position. Dengetsu at a very young age was sent away to Tamba Kameyama Castle in Tamba province. And this is where people believe that she received an education in several different areas, calligraphy, some say the martial arts even, as a daughter of a biological father of samurai status. Then she returns home and gets married in 1807. She divorces. Um, her, her life is famous um, also for being quite tragic. So at the age of 17, 19, and 24, she loses three children and she divorces her first husband, remarries, and then her second husband dies in 1823. So there is some speculation that she had another son who survived, but who was sent out for adoption before she married for a second time. Dengetsu maintains contact with that young man, and it seems she has vested interest in him, making, making it seem as though she might be his biological mother. So there are traces that amid these deaths of all of her children, she had perhaps one lasting parental relationship. Whatever the case may be, in 1823, her second husband dies, and this seems to be when things really change for her. So she takes the Buddhist vow, she takes the tonsure um, alongside her adoptive father, who um, takes the name of Saishin, and she takes the Buddhist name of Bengetsu. And this is another um, closer image to show you that Shionin complex where she lived. And the family lived for quite a while, Dengetsu and her daughter and her adoptive father at 
um, Makazuan, which I've um, noted here in green. So you go through the temple gate and it's located in this area here in the, in the complex. Now this building is used for um, tea ceremonies, um, but she lived there for about a decade and there's no doubt um, this is the time when she began engaging in various art forms. So um, her daughter unfortunately died at the age of seven um, and she lived alone with her aging father until then he died seven years later. So after her adoptive father died, then she had to leave the Cheongin Temple complex and she began to move around Kyoto into various um, residences. So this kind of inaugurates a peripatetic period for her. And she even acquires the nickname of Hikoshi Bengetsu, or uh, kind of Bengetsu on the move, someone who's always relocating her residence. One reason is that she was so popular and well-known that she was inundated with visitors and she was attempting to lead a less high profile existence. So she moved slowly northward into the Okazaki area, into a neighborhood a neighborhood called Shogoin, then Shinshoji, and then for the final years of her life, she lived at Jinkoin on the western edge of the capital, which you can see over here. And this is where she uh, ultimately passed away. The abbots there over the years became important connoisseurs of her works. Um, and there are also um, actually many uh, copies and sort of examples of her work done by others. Um, but there are several um, etching coin that are quite um, secure in their attribution. So it's while she's living at Shogoin that she that she met Tessai. So his family lived nearby, and he helped her with her ceramics. He moved clay, for example, and this really um, solidified their relationship. But one very important aspect of Denkitz's profile, um, as I mentioned, that is that she was famous in her own day, not just after death. And she was well known in her lifetime for her poetry. She um, had her poems published in two different anthologies in 1868 and in 1871, although she was not um, happy to have them published. She was actually averse to having them, averse to having them published in this form. Um, there were some poems that she claimed weren't even hers in these anthologies. And one scholar, um, Sayumi Takahashi, has suggested that her deep interest in the material properties of her waka poetry inscribed on things is really what turned her against having her works in print, that it diminished the kind of that sense of immediacy that many of her object oriented works have. So her waka were then disembodied from the material surfaces onto which she had um, inscribed them. So um, Dengetsu was listed in the uh, who's who at the time of famous people in, in Kyoto. And she was therefore asked to brush her calligraphy and her poems on all sorts of different objects. So she brushed them individually on um, works on paper that you can see here. And she might have close to 1000 poems in different an anthologies, but there are so many more of her poems because she reiterated them on all of these different services. So she would inscribe the same poem on many different kinds of objects. So these poem cards called shikishi, on poem strips called tanzaku, and on, for example, hanging scrolls that have pictures included called wakae. So these would have been created at the request of individuals for um, all sorts of reasons. She made them for New Year's. Um, these are very typical reasons in Edo period Japan for making calligraphy objects. And these were often collaborative as well. So she um, uses a kind of script that is called kana in Japanese that you can see here. It is a kind of uh, phonetic script that does not involve um, Chinese characters. Um, not many Chinese characters, there are a few here and there. Um, and it is a, a type of script that has long been associated with the so-called women's writing, women's hand. These are kind of generic distinctions um, also that linked kana to private modes of writing, to waka poetry, that was her main uh, form of poetry, as well as to vernacular kind of tale literature. 
But there are, of course, examples of female Chinese um, uh, literati inscribing their paintings and characters as well. But this was really the mode that Bengutsu stuck to for her entire life. So her calligraphy is unique. It's very elegant. As you can see, it uses these incredibly thin gossamer lines. A very thin brush is used to execute these um, kana forms. There are occasional linkages between them, but there's an overall impression of the, the kana, the phonetics, and you can see, see them transcribed here um, in, uh, in the printed type that I've included. They're kind of distinct. They're not so linked as to be difficult to decipher. Each form kind of stands on its own, and that's also very characteristic of her kind of calligraphy. It's rounded, it's plump, um, it has this kind of very breathy quali quality to it because the lines are so thin. There's a lot of paper, um, blank space that is included in her work. And you can see some places where she lifts the brush from the paper, but very minimal. It's not that kind of dramatic calligraphic lifting and emphasis that you find in the work of, um, for example, uh, calligraphers like Tessai. And here you can see her work um, in the center compared to two female calligraphers, contemporaries of hers, which um, are not uh, dissimilar, but I think you can get a, maybe get a start to get a sense of Dan Getz's unique hand. It's almost immediately recognizable when you see it, um, when you come across these objects that were made by Dan Getsu. So she became most famous for um, her scripts that she added to her ceramics and for inscribing her ceramics. And you can see here some of the kinds of vessels that she inscribed her poetry on. So teapots and kettles, tea bowls and sake bottles and cups, as well as these un more unusual forms. Um, the brazier that I showed you at the beginning, at the beginning of the talk for sencha kind of tea, these pots and lidded pots, for example. So Dengitsu did not invent ceramic inscription, but she did it in a way that really no one had done before, in abundance, with her own original, original poetry and on every shape and size of vessel. So this uh, now brings me to the kind of main objects of inquiry that I'd like to focus on for this talk. And I'll begin with this example of, of the sake bottle and cup, which opens up onto a range of things that we might consider, even uh, beginning with ideas uh, in feminist theory, when we think about this contemplating her gender and then gets his place as a female artist, even though it's complicated in her identity because she was a nun. Um, there's a way in which this kind of material lends itself to ideas that are current in feminist theory about uh, or that have been in terms of the material turn um, and material feminisms and also a, a kind of renewed emphasis um, in breaking down this idea of discourse versus material, that dichotomy. So trying to question those boundaries between um, text and material objects which also expands to the breaking down of other um, dichotomies. So this traditional framework in which materiality is seen as antithetical to the discursive, in other words, as oppositional to writing, to logos, it provides really a kind of interesting foil for thinking about Dengetsu's work. And that's because Dengetsu's work really unsettles the very terms of that debate so um, I would argue that what makes Rengetsu's work kind of most distinctive is this additional register of a kind of embodiment that occurs through the waka poems that are inscribed into and sometimes written on the surface of her vessels. Though the, the inscribed waka engage in what I've called in this talk a haptic poetics, which combines the discursive as well as the um, kind of material. So it's interesting then to contemplate how poetry intersects with um, the body 
through its um, being inscribed on the vessel. And it might do so, for example, through the voice. So the poetry can become kind of embodied when the poem is vocalized. And, and that way, it's kind of interesting to think about Dengetsu's calligraphy as being so clear and having the phonemes of the language be so distinct because it almost prompts a kind of desire to vocalize these poems when you see them. They're what you could call hyper legible. They're not difficult to read. And that almost kind of uh, makes the viewer want to then say them out loud. And when that happens, even if it's a kind of imaginary recitation of the poem, it kind of engages the body in another way than simply reading or viewing those vessels. And with that in mind, I'd like to go through some other types of kind of haptics that we could talk about with Bengetsu ceramics, um, beginning with this sake bottle and a cup that could be used on any number of occasions at the start of a sencha tea ceremony, for example, um, for a celebratory toast. And um, many of the small sake cups accompany these kind of bottles. You, you'll find inscriptions that are very felicitous in nature. So these are ceramics appropriate for use in marking special occasions. And for that reason, they have kind of good luck poetic verses on them. So for example, in this small cup that you see here, you find the poem which reads um, in English as the young crane's timeless voice heard through the ages. It sings of an imperial reign that lasts for a thousand generations. So this is a poem that is alluding to the longevity of an imperial reign, for the reign of the emperor in the 19th century, um, but also longevity in general it could be used that way, it could be taken more on an abstract level for those who would experience life and their descendants through the temporality of the imperial reign. So it's kind of thinking about a subject who is living within this environment. And um, you can see how Dengetsu has placed the character, the uh, graphs, the conographs on the, the bowl they appear with the first lines of the poem. The young crane appears on the inside here. And then the rest of the poem continues on the outside of um, the vessel. So this will be important. It's necessary to turn the tea bowl, the tea, I'm sorry, the sake cup in order to read it. And then on the sake bottle, there is this interesting um, poem that reads an old tanuki, foraging for sake. Perhaps this is how he passes the leisure hours on a rainy night. So I've included the part of the verse that you can see in the photo and what you can't see um, in the brackets. So you can see this part and then you would need to turn it to read the rest of the verse. And I'd like to focus, so not on what happens when we merely look and read these objects on their kind of visuality or even their haptic visuality. So even looking at the screen and these photographs, we almost want to touch these objects and it engenders a kind of sense of, of, of touch, a kind of what's been called the haptic visuality. But we can also think about then how they would have actually been used. So not as they were just represented in the photo, but as objects held in space and time and the kind of haptic sense perception involved in using Bengetsu ceramics. Um, so this isn't really about the embodied creator in the object, although that, that's important too, but about the user. So the inscribed ceramic is haptic in the sense that it doesn't simply engage that tactility of the object. It involves, so then more than a passive reception of feeling on the surface, or even a momentary touching of the object, but rather it necessitates an interaction that involves this kinesthetic sense, moving the object, so to turning it, to perceive it in its totality. And the poem is what leads you there. So the ceramic object held in the hands um, already does this to a certain extent. When you lift up a tea bowl in a tea ceremony, for example, you have 
you know, it's it's actually prescribed that you would turn it and examine it and so forth. So you're led there anyway. Um, but when a waka poem is placed on an object in this way, it has to be turned for the entire poem to be revealed. So the words guide you through this um, kinesthetic experience of the work. And the words, um, and neither do the words exist isolated from space and time. So the partial revelations of the poem are perceived and read in conjunction with other sensory information received from the texture and the physical material of the object. So we can imagine moving our fingers over the surface to sense the depth of the incision that Van Goetze has, been made, has made. Uh, because the words are dug out of the body of the vessel, out of the clay, the writing implies a stylus which has connotations of the primitive, of the earliest examples of writing on objects. This is kind of information that her incisions impart. But remarkably, the writing is equally evocative of delicate brushwork. The fluidity of movement in Bengetsu's writing is stunning, given the clay ground, even resembling the kana writing found on her works on paper. It somehow is suggestive of both the stylus and the brush. If you look closely at the incisions, you can sometimes find deposits along the edges of the lines. Um, those are sometimes visible. The inscribed writing as calligraphy adds yet another dimension to this notion of embodiment and haptics. So the visual experience of East Asian calligraphy has long been theorized as rooted in the body with brush and ink on paper. Um, calligraphy is thought of as movement recorded so ancient calligraphic treatises in China abound with examples of how writing is related to the body, to the breath of the calligrapher, which is then captured on paper for future generations to retrace and, in a sense, reanimate the calligrapher. The embedded body of the writer in the writing antic anticipates a future kind of symbiotic relationship with, a, a, with another. So, there is also this added dimension of a kind of ethos of a symbiotic or intersubjective relationship between calligrapher and later reader. And this is apparent in the case of Bengetsu's haptic poetics as well, between the poet potter and the later user of her vessels. So take, for example, how the user processes sensory information based on the perceived tactile qualities of the vessel and then adjusts the body. So in an act of mimesis, the body naturally mirrors the object. When, the, um, when one perceives a kind of fragile, delicate object, for example, as, as we might perceive um, this small um, sake cup when it's, when it's held, um, information is sent to the brain through the nerve fibers connected to receptors in the hand that sends signals to the central nervous system. And then the grip adjusts so that one handles the object lightly, differently. It's a kind of act of non-dualism between the mind and the body. Um, everything kind of adjusts to accommodate the fragility of the object. And this I think is interesting in considering how women's art, how some of Ben Getsu's works might be stereotypically talked about in gender terms as perhaps dainty and frail. But if we think about them in terms of haptic dynamics, these objects also wield a tremendous power over the user, demanding a light touch, insisting in their own materiality on a gentle approach, if only for a moment. It insists on humility in meeting, um, uh, in meeting the object in a kind of conformity to mutual physical states. It commands a certain kind of attention, like a whisper. So then gets a sense of um, working involved her identity as a Buddhist nun. And she, I think it's fair to say, might have worked with this idea in mind, um, this idea that um, it is important, one of the basic tenets of Buddhism, to think about non-dualism non and this kind of symbiotic relationship that um, I think could find expression in these objects. Let me just turn now to uh, one more example, the, another uh, sake bottle. And, you know, there's also a lot of humor and um, play in Bengetsu's works. 
and here's um, a poem that matches in interesting ways with the, the function of the sake bottle. As you can see, the uh, translation of the poem reads, fine sake in balance becomes an elixir for perpetual youth and long life. So here is a, a, a sake bottle that actually evokes a kind of medicine container and that links to this notion of an elixir for perpetual youth. It can also uh, kind of tie in with this notion of, of sake that is offered to the gods on a celebratory occasion. And this is uh, very much related to what waka poetry is doing in 19th century poetic theory in Japan. So there's this notion of the kind of power of language, of its kind of attempt, of its ability to kind of um, contain a, sac a sacrality and that links it with um, this kind of spiritual nature of language. And um, this is another example of the kind of hyper-legible quality of Bengetsu works that might lead to such a kind of recitation that then intersects on so many le levels in terms of haptics and embodiment. So Bengetsu, as I've um, shown you, her, her waka, her poetry corpus, appears to be characterized by a kind of bold assertiveness of, of selfhood. Um, it's foregrounded in the kind of voice of the poet and even in the materiality of her work, the way she uniquely etched her incisions of haptic poetry on her ceramics, um, that kind of unwavering distinctiveness of her calligraphic style and the consistent inclusion of her name and her even her age on her work. So she always, uh, almost always wrote her name um, on, her, on her artworks and there's also a way in which her collaborators sublimate their own styles to match her artistic register. So there's a way that we could talk about this in terms of empowerment, in terms of um, a kind of embodied work, um, in terms, again, of a kind of feminist lens that kind of would reclaim her work, that would talk about its importance that way. And that can be done very productively, I think. Um, but there's also a way I think that we could think about this notion of embodiment, materiality, and the assertion of the self in Bengetsu's work as being tied to Buddhism and Buddhist notions of the body that are actually kind of contradictory in that way. And what I'm talking about here is Buddhist notions of a non-self a kind of privileging of the insubstantial in Buddhist philosophy. So in this way, even Bengetsu's most visceral, substantial, embodied ceramic artifacts convey an ethos of the insubstantial. There is, um, rather than the corporeal um, and in a kind of imposing embodiment, there is this kind of element of disembodiment or what might best be called incorporality throughout her work. So for an artist most readily associated with embodiment, um, this is a kind of interesting paradox. And um, it's a way uh, of looking at her works that opens onto some issues where that allow us to question our maybe emphasis on interpreting artworks on an individualistic level she, her work suggests that there might be alternative notions of selfhood that um, could be better articulated, at least when it comes to artistic persona for someone in her time and place. And it's clear, for example, that she conceptualized her poetry as a kind of, um, of, of works that were symbiotic with poetic personae who came before her. And what I'd uh, like to do now to sort of give some evidence of this notion of a Buddhist non-self non -self and perhaps what she was aspiring to is to turn now to one final image and that is um, a self-portrait and a death poem. So at the time of Bengetsu's death in 1875, Bengetsu had been a Buddhist nun for over 50 years. She took vows in her early 30s after the successive deaths of all four of her children, 
and one husband after the other. She changed her name to Dengetsu, which literally means Lotus, Den, Moon, Getsu. And this name is central to the death poem that she created and which was viewed as a kind of culmination of her, um, of her poetic um, output. And here you can see that the poem is, um, reads, how I pray, or this could be uh, translated as um, my wish, um, is to be in the next world, seated on a lotus flower, gazing at the cloudless moon above. So in the poem, Dengetsu envisions herself already beyond death in a realm beyond, above the lotus flower, sitting above a lotus flower. So she inscribed her death poem um, on at least one scroll, and you can see an example here and the poem is in between an image of the moon um, and her own self-portrait, which I apologize, is very difficult to see. Uh, this, the whereabouts of this work are unknown, but it appears in a, a publication. And it shows Dengetsu wearing the dark robes of a Buddhist nun and seemingly with a walking stick in hand, an image of a peripatetic traveler like her uh, the poems in the past that she emulated, like Saigyo or our poets like Basho. So in the context of this death poem that's inscribed here, the journey that she's on can only be interpreted as a spiritual one. So the composition of Dengetsu's self-portrait with the poem um, that rests between two pictorial images is intriguing because what it does is it kind of prefigures the creation of Dengetsu's death shroud. Um, this was a cloth that um, it was described in a remarkable anecdote by the artist Tomio Kotesai, who, um, who, as I've explained, was her protege from the time of his youth. So when Dengetsu was in her 70s, so she died at 85, but she was thinking about her death in her 70s, she asked Tessai to paint her namesake imagery. So the lotus flower, the den, and the moon, Getsu, on a white cotton cloth that she had made herself. She folded up the cloth, put it away, and Tessai claims that he says he, he forgot about the whole episode. Then when Dengetsu passed away at the age of 85, Tessai was there and he realized that the women of the village who had washed her body um, had wrapped Dengetsu's body in the, that very cloth that she had asked him um, to draw imagery on. And he beheld her enshrouded body, and he realized that between the images of the lotus and moon that he himself had rendered years before, Dengetsu had put her death verse. So unbeknownst to Tessai, Dengetsu had quietly orchestrated one final collaboration between herself and her younger student, of which there had been many over the years. So between Tessai's lotus and moon pictures, Dengetsu brushed this poem that imagines herself after death, present between the lotus and the moon. Dengetsu graphically represented herself through the Buddhist name she had taken 50 years before in her own calligraphic lettering, representing a fervent desire that her body, <clears throat> her body and mind in this world and the next be pure and unsullied and achieve ultimate illumination, which is symbolized by the moon. So poetically, graphically, pictorially, Dengetsu rehearsed the negation and subsequent rebirth of a non-self. But she did so in the most literal act of embodied inscription that she had ever performed. So she used her own body covered in the shroud as the vehicle for her waka. So interestingly, interestingly, the poem too is an act of, of shared sentiment as it reworks the death poem of that early, ain't that, that very classical period monk, Saigyo. So time doesn't permit me to explain Dengetsu's waka poetics and the importance of intertextuality in her work. But let me just say that in her poetry, she worked through poems of the past and envisioned a kind of intersubjective relationship with them and their authors as in this final creative act 
So she enfolded herself within poetic worlds of past, present, and future. And I think by keeping this one final act in mind, we can then read back onto her ceramics and then perhaps find this yet other dimension to the haptic poetics that um, she so consistently engaged uh, throughout her life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa, uh, for this amazing talk. Um, so now we will uh, open for questions. Um, I don't know if Claudia already wants to. Yeah, thank uh, you so much. It was fascinating, yeah. Um, I, uh, I will be really quick because I don't want to be disturbing with where I am. I'm so sorry about this. But I, uh, I think this, um, her, her world is a world that seems also very like closed within Japanese tradition. And I'm very interested in the fact that you mentioned in the beginning that she is one of these artists that kind of like went through a lot of change, right? And um, was seeing a Japan that is in transformation in the 19th century. And I was wondering if um, how she reacted to that, if you think that um, like her poetry and this specific poetics that she developed is somehow related to where she is situated in this moment. Thanks so much, Claudia. That's a great question. Um, and it deserves much elaboration to really flesh out the real context. This is a time when there is, uh, yeah, it's important to think always about, I think, global context and the global flows that might have been happening um, in, her, in her world. Uh, but as you said, I, I do think, you know, a lot, much of her day-to-day -day existence was very much focused on her immediate environment of not just Kyoto, but actually she was known throughout um, Honshu and um, her word spread of her work. So there was a lot to occupy her. She does interestingly have one poem that mentions America, <laughs> um, only one, um, but it's, it's kind of fascinating, but um, hard to read too deeply into it. Um, there's so much that occupies her in her immediate world, but I think it's, it would be interesting actually maybe to juxtapose, even if she wasn't herself that engaged, interesting and important to juxtapose others who are more engaged with things beyond the archipelago, um, just to put them side by side and, and to see, to get a sense of that time period. Um, but she, she does engage the new very much. And that was a kind of uh, very important to her poetics. And it aligns with the kind of poetic theory that was um, very much current in her day, certain thinkers on poetry who wrote treatises on poetics, where it was important to add elements of the new, of the immediate, of, of the contemporary, and to mix them with elements from the past. And so, for example, there's a poem where she uses the imagery of, of the sound of gunfire um, as uh, to replace the traditional images that you would find of sounds on the wind in classical poetry. And that's a really, I think, fascinating, jarring use of a very kind of new form of warfare, relatively new form of warfare that she's incorporating into a classical poem that you associate with the kind of just very simple images of nature, for example, or imagery that's been used over and over for centuries and centuries. Thank you. That that is uh, really fascinating. I think she, her work is amazing. <laughs> Do we have questions, Patricia? Sorry. Yes, we do have questions. <laughs> so uh, here's a, a question from Fernando. Fernando, uh, hi Fernando. <laughs> um, he asks, uh, dear Professor McCormick, thank you so much for this amazing talk. Is there a thematic difference in the poems inscribed on very fine ceramics versus more rough vessels? And, it's a, he, it's a, and he has a follow-up as well. 
And thus the function of the vessel influenced the poem that was chosen to inscribe it, like the sake cup with a felicitous toast-like poem. That's a great question. And that's a wonderful um, way to go through the archive of her work and to create a, a database and to kind of systematically figure out um, in the works that I've studied so far, there is sometimes, um, sometimes that is definitely the case. Um, sake bottles that are self-referential, um, works that are, oh, I, and I could, if I could, um, if I had time to show you the poem on the, the brazier, for example, which is um, basically about a very turbulent river. And so I, I think there's always a way to read into the, the poem and what it might be doing in terms of the function of the vessel. So on that one, you can imagine the brazier on fire, essentially containing a fire, rousing the water in the same way that a turbulent river would be engaged. And, and here the poem is about a gusting storm that has passed and in its wake, the river is so turbulent that the shallow there's no way for the waterways to create shallows of their own that is so you can't you can't it's unnavigable um and so i think that's a fantastic poem to put there if you imagine not just fire but the water that's being produced from the fire and it's so almost counterintuitive to think of putting some or it's maybe not to think of putting something i mean it's good luck don't burn the house down you put the water imagery on the brazier um so um, there are lots of ways in which no matter the intent even, I think you can look at the effect of what's been done, of, of how even if it doesn't work, it doesn't seem to co correspond to the vessel and kind of think about then maybe with this emphasis again on the viewer, on the user, what does it do to the, in the mind of the viewer and user, even if it wasn't intended. There are some cases where the poem seems odd to put on certain vessels and it I would maybe it might seem disappointing. Um, and, um, but again, I think we can overlook that and look for potential associations that could be interesting. I mean, this also ties into the issue of just the tremendous number of objects that exist that are attributed to Dengetsu. She had um, one well-known apprentice who would actually, you know, in her own day, you know, sign her name to works. And so something that's always talked about with Dengitsu is the issue of forgeries. Um, but I think that's a problematic concept in many ways. Um, you know, this kind of desire to look for something that's authentic, it, that needs to be, I think, analyzed within the context of her environment as well. Perfect. And uh, to do a follow-up on <laughs> Fernando's question because it's a curiosity of, of mine because you mentioned that uh, of course she inscribed many vessels but she also wrote in very various uh, objects and uh, those objects are were they actually used or because you mentioned she was very popular and uh, so when she inscribed on something was this object actually used? And, and I'm asking that because I was considering um, the, the last part uh, of your presentation on, on Buddhism and the idea of uh, absence and presence of a self and of matter and of mind and, and poetics and, and the idea of actually using the vessel would, would be very interesting. So because you, you deal with the, the emptiness of the vessel and, or, or maybe not, I don't know. So that's why I'm asking about the, the actual use of these objects, if they were only seen as uh, poetic and artful objects or they had like an actual use. In general, they're very much used. Um, she, you know, it's, she sold them. She made a living through the pottery there are archeo there's a, one archaeological site that I've uh, that I know about um, that shows uh, kind of use of her objects among um, kind of different um, class class register, right? So not 
the elite of the elite by any means, um, but that um, it was available. And I think um, she speaks in humble terms about her objects and they have a kind of humble appearance to them. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm not sure when they began being sort of collected and unused. Mm -hmm. um, and even if that doesn't have to do with collection, like you're saying, if that there's another reason why they might be just sort of possessed or, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in general, a lot of use happened. Yeah, so when, when someone bought it, they, they would actually like the, the sake bottle. I would think so, yes. It's very, very interesting. <laughs> because uh, in, in the functionality also, uh, the, the haptic aspect seems to uh, take a, a, a life of its own, a greater, not only manipulating it to actually read the poem, but, but the actual use. I think activates it in a, in a in a different way. It's maybe a new layer of uh, meaning and embodiment that uh, can happen. So so it's really fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you have any other questions for now, but we actually are uh, in our time limit. So I think uh, I'll thank you again for this uh, amazing talk and uh, thank all uh, the uh, audience members that usually follow our uh, programs. And uh, stay tuned for uh, the next uh, appointment of the, the Nian uh, lecture series. Thank you very much. Thank you much. so much. Thank you.